moms in the rooms, God bless you. We thank you for all that you do for us. And I hope you have a wonderful, blessed day today uh, in spite of the downpours of weather. We're glad that you're here this morning. I know weather's kept some folks home today, I'm sure, but we're glad that you're here. May the opportunity to come out to worship. Let's stand together this morning and let's sing together this morning. Oh, worship the King, all glorious Well, good morning and welcome to First Baptist Conroe. I'm James Brown, the media pastor here, and I would like to say welcome to you and also happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. I hope you have a very sweet Mother's Day. Um, Mother's Day to me always feels like, a, in some ways, it's it's the, the gateway to summer, and it's certainly feeling like summer around here, not just with the, the hot weather and all the rain and stuff, but uh, all the activities that we're getting ready for. We have kids ministry stuff happening, we have student ministry stuff happening, uh, VBS, camps, sports camps, mission trips. Uh, if you sign up for our newsletter by scanning the QR code on the pew in front of you or on the screen right around here, you can keep up to date with all the things that are happening, not just in kids ministry and student ministry, but all the things that are happening in the life of our church all throughout the summer. Now I want you to think back to when you were a preteen. Uh, maybe it was the 90s, maybe it was the 70s, Maybe the 50s, maybe the 30s, is that possible? I guess somebody in our church could have been a kid in the 30s. Stand up if you were, no. <laughs> uh, if think back of those, those memories when you were that age and think about when you went to camp for the first time. Well, if you love those memories and you want to create special memories for some of our preteen preteens going to camp, the next Sunday we are having a fundraiser to help uh, create scholarships and offset some of the costs there for preteen camp. So uh, bring your piggy banks to church next week and help out the fundraiser there for the preteen camp. 
Now today is Mother's Day, and we have some uh, mothers of preschoolers here that meet uh, every other week on a Monday here at the church. And uh, it's a great group, and they're getting larger and larger and larger. And as they get larger, well, they have preschoolers that need to be watched. So if you would like to come help uh, watch some of those preschoolers and be involved in the child care for that program, just contact Kathy or Bethany. Mops is really a great ministry, and, and helping out with child care would be such a blessing to those moms who just want to take Take a break, eat some tasty little brunch, and learn from some mentors through that program. So if you'd like to help out in that way, contact us soon. Now remember, we're still collecting shoes all throughout the month of May, so if you'd like to buy some new shoes, uh, small shoes, large shoes, please bring those to the church and drop those off. Uh, your giving last month was awesome, and we want to encourage you to give shoes this month. And speaking of giving, you can drop off an offering in one of the boxes out in the atrium, or you can scan that QR code on the pew in front of you and send it electronically through the, the, the magic of the internet. And with all that being said, uh, let's start off with a word of prayer this morning. God, we pray this morning as we open our hearts to sing to you, to learn about you, God, that you give us peace that passes understanding. God, fill us with your holiness, fill us with your love, fill us with your compassion, and destroy the fear that is in our lives. Father, we pray this in your name. Amen. Let's stand together again and continue to sing. We serve a holy God who is worthy of all of our praise. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful,
singing this. Good morning. It's great to see y'all. Uh, we're, we're so blessed to have our orchestra. They did a great job today. That song, in case you don't know, it's Shout to the Lord. It's about 20 years old. Uh, we've, we also sang some songs today that are much older than that that I really enjoy. I, I said in the first service, because we sang the song, Oh, Worship the King, in the first service as well. I doubt that Robert knew when he planned that song that it would in, that the line, uh, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark as his night on the wings of the storm was going to be so appropriate this morning. But I, I am really thankful for those of you that are able to make it today. I know there are people who are usually here in this service that are probably sitting it out at home. And if you're watching us online, I hope 
I uh, hope you know we still love you and have happy Mother's Day to you too. But uh, either way, it's good to get together around God's word and to praise his name. Um, I want to start with this before we get into the word. This is the last sermon in our series on fear. Uh, next week we're going to start a new series uh, about Hebrews 11. I think I can probably find some material in Hebrews 11 to preach on. Uh, but I, I wanted to do this as we close this series today. If you are struggling with fear right now in some area of your life, uh, some, something's going on that, you're, that really has you consumed with anxiety, fear, or worry, or maybe you just generalized fear and anxiety, uh, would you raise your hand so we can pray for you? If you don't mind, raise your hand. Okay. If somebody near you raised their hand, pray for them. If you don't know their name, then God does. But let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we're grateful uh, for your faithfulness. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless those who are here and those at home who are struggling right now. And you know what they're facing, obstacles that seem insurmountable. Lord, just uh, things that keep them up at night. I pray that you would be the peace that passes understanding for them, that you would bring them through the storms of life, that we would be a faithful church to help bear their burdens, and that you would glorify yourself in their lives. And I pray, Lord, that everything I say right now would be biblical and true and would be exactly what all of us need to hear. We're so glad you're with us, Lord. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's what we've learned so far in this series. The first ser sermon uh, on Easter Sunday, we talked about how the problem with fear isn't how it makes you feel, it's what it makes you do. So God's not disappointed or angry with you if you are worried or afraid. That doesn't mean you have weak faith. Uh, but it's how do you respond to that fear? Do you stop, let it stop you from doing the will of God? Or do you, like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, get up and say, thy will be done, Lord? Then uh, we talked about the second week, identifying voices in your life that produce fear. And, and stop listening to those voices. Those voices lie to you. They make you believe things that aren't true. We talked about the fear of God and how the fear of God, when we increase in it, it overcomes all other fears. We talked about how worshiping is one of the best ways to respond to fear. When we are struggling, when we're afraid, that's the best time to sing a song of praise to the Lord. And then last week, we talked about spiritual vision, seeing the world through God's eyes, and how overcoming fear takes that kind of spiritual vision so you can learn to trust Him more. And maybe you're sitting there saying, that's great, Jeff, I'm glad to know God's not mad at me for my worry and fear, but can't He do something to take those fears away? Can't, there's, isn't there something I can do to learn to be more courageous and less fearful? Isn't there something in the Bible about peace that passes understanding? Yes, there is. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But first, before we get into that scripture, I want to address something else that maybe I should have addressed in the very beginning. There are some who would say that Christians should not need counseling, therapy, psychology, medication when they struggle with anxiety, worry, depression, or any of those things. Just, just read the Bible, just pray, and God will take care of the rest. And I've heard some well-known preachers say that. And what do I believe? Well, first thing I believe is the brain is as much a part of the body as any other organ. We don't, no matter how devout you are, you don't tell somebody with clogged arteries or a broken bone or lung cancer, well, just pray and trust God to take care of it. No, you say, hey, God called certain people to be medical professionals. He gave them knowledge. He gave them training. And they're not perfect. They make mistakes. But they're a resource that we go to, and alongside God, they heal us. Why don't we do that with disorders of the brain? We should. I've had uh, members of my own family who've struggled with anxiety such that uh, beyond ordinary fear and worry, it was the kind of thing that just was debilitating. They couldn't function and do ordinary things in life that were necessary to, to live a happy and productive life because of this fear that was going on in their brains. And, and they've gotten help through professionals. And I encourage you to do the same thing if you face panic attacks, if you face situations where night after night after night you can't sleep, if you can't do simple things in this life because of this irrational sense of fear. That's not, that's not, your, that's not because there's anything uh, sinful about you. It's not because you don't have faith in God. There's something going on in your mind that needs treatment, and you should seek that treatment. However, even if you do and even if it works, you will still have to deal with fears like you and I, like everybody else. All of us face fearful situations, worrisome situations. What do we do with those? How do we rise above them? 
Today I want to talk about what the Bible says about finding peace. Finding peace in the storm. So verse 4 of Philippians chapter 4. You might have that open in your lap as I read and as I continue to preach today. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is any, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In 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 any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So verse 7 is the verse that we know so well, the peace of God passes all understanding. And I've talked to Christians who've told me that they've prayed in the midst of terrible times, and they felt that peace of God just descend upon them like a warm blanket, and, and suddenly they're at peace. But I've talked to many, many, many more very devout and sincere Christians who would say, I tried that and it didn't work. I prayed and I prayed and I gave God what I was afraid of and I was still just as scared afterwards. And they know, they know enough to know that God's word doesn't lie and that God doesn't fail, so they naturally assume that they're at fault. I think we need to understand something. Verse 7 is not the only verse about fear in that passage. Remember, the verses were not there when Paul wrote this. This was a letter. Do you, do you write verses in your emails or your text messages or your, um, if you still write letters? Do you write verses in your letters? No. This is one long thought that I just read, one long thought about fear. So don't just take that one verse out of context. In order to experience the peace of God that passes all understanding, sometimes it comes like a miracle from above, but mostly I think it's something that we grow in over time. As we grow in our trust in God, we learn to trust Him more, and we fear less. That's the peace of God that passes understanding. I'm not just making that up, by the way. That's what Paul says in verse 11. Here he is, Paul, in prison for no good crime. I'm sure on a regular basis he hears prisoners being dragged out of their cells and brought out to the chopping block so they can be executed. And he knows it could be me next time. And yet, he's content. And yet, he's at peace. Now, what does he say? Does he say, I'm at peace because I trust God? No, he says, I have learned. This didn't come naturally to me. I wasn't born with a naturally calm disposition, but I have learned in any and every circumstance to be content because he grew in his trust in God. Back in September of 2008, September 1st, actually, to be precise, Hurricane Ike hit this part of the world. Many of you were here and remember that. Believe it or not, that's been 15 years ago. My kids were real little then. We were living uh, out southwest of Houston, and so we knew the storm was going to affect us. And I had one of those those moments where I was like, okay, this is the kind of thing a dad should do. So I sat down with my kids. So it's August 31st. The the storm we know is going to hit that night while we're in bed. And I said, listen, tonight the storm's coming in, and you're going to hear some scary sounds. You're going to hear the wind blowing like it's never, like you've never heard it before. You're going to hear a ton of rain. You're, you might even hear some hail. Uh, you're going to hear the house make some weird noises because the wind's going to be blowing it and it's going to creak and it's going to moan. And I said, just when you hear that, don't be afraid because it's going to be okay. This house is strong enough to withstand all that. So we're going to be all right. Don't be afraid. And I was right. I didn't tell them that we were going to lose power for several days, which we did. I didn't tell them that there were people closer to the coast who died. There was tremendous damage from that hurricane. We didn't suffer much of it, just lost all the food in our fridge and freezer, but that's the peace of God 
The peace of God is knowing, okay, there's a storm on the way, and it could get scary, and it could even be painful, but I'm going to make it. I'm going to be okay because I'm with God. Because what is the worst this world can do to me? Are they going to kill me? Well, then that's victory. Are they going to are they going to torment me? Are they going to put me through painful circumstances? Well, then I get to identify with Christ and his sufferings for my behalf. Or are they going to take away my loved ones? I get to see them again in glory. What can this world do to me? That's the peace of God. It's learning to trust in him. Now, did my little speech work for my kids? I don't know. I didn't ask them the next day. And if you ask them now, they probably wouldn't remember that, even though it's my peak dad moment in, in all my years. They probably are like, I don't know. I don't remember that. But I will say this. The amount that they were at peace that night depended on how much they trusted me. Because if they believed what their dad said, they heard the house creaking and moaning. They thought, oh, yeah, that's what dad said. I'm not worried. You may have noticed this. I've preached the same sermon six times. This is the sixth time. The same sermon, because the main point of all six is the same. It's the more you trust God, the less you fear. The more you trust God, the less fear rules your life. Doesn't mean we eliminate fear from our lives. Jesus in the garden was terrified, but he overcame it. But the more you trust, the less you fear. And that's what we're talking about. Now, how do we trust God more? I want to give you from this passage two habits, two things to do to increase your trust in God, two things to do when you are afraid to grow in that peace of God that passes understanding. And the first one is, think about the right things. Think about the right things. Now, I'm going to do something a little silly, but y'all work with me. There's, there's a purpose behind this. I want to do an experiment. I want to just test you. So I'm going to say go. In a minute, I'm going to tell you to close your eyes, and I'm going to say go, and I want you to go 15 seconds without thinking about me. Okay? So 15 seconds, just empty your mind of any thoughts of me. I do not exist for those 15 seconds, okay? And just to help you, I want you to close your eyes. So ready? Close your eyes, and I'm going to time you starting now. Hey. Hey. Y'all hear me? Nobody's looking. It, it really hurts my feelings when you ignore me this way. Um, you know, I'm right up here. Did you forget? Okay, that's 15 seconds. You can open your eyes. How'd you do? I don't... I doubt you did very well. See, what I'm trying to illustrate is that's what happens when we say, okay, tomorrow I have this big meeting with my boss and I don't know what he's going to say. Uh, uh, my girlfriend's about to break up with me, I think. I, I hope that's not the case. My, my kid's in trouble and I don't know what to do. I've got a doctor's appointment and I'm worried about it. I'm just not going to think about it. That's why that never works. Our brains don't work that way. You can't empty your mind of bad thoughts. By the way, that's true of all bad thoughts anger, lust. You can't just say, I refuse to think about that. So what do we do instead? We fill our minds with good thoughts. You may have never noticed this, but verse 7 that talks about the peace of God is followed by verse 8 that says, instead, whatever is lovely, whatever is true, whatever is beautiful, whatever is commendable, whatever is noble, whatever is excellent, whatever is worthy of praise, think about these things. Don't lay in your bed wallowing around thinking, oh, please stop thinking those ugly thoughts. Get up, turn on your light, open your Bible, or start singing a song of praise. Or get the church prayer list off our website and just pray through all those names and all those needs, or, or pray by name for all the people in your life group, all the people in your extended family, all the people in your neighborhood, your workplace. See, when we're afraid and we're just filled with anxiety like that, usually one of two or maybe both things are true. Either it's the devil tormenting you or it's just your own mind that, that doesn't have enough trust in God yet to trust him with this circumstance. So if, if it's the devil and you start praying and praising and studying scripture, he's going to leave you the heck alone. Because the last thing in the world he wants to do is motivate us to get closer to God. That's the best way to go to sleep, is to start praying. But if it's your mind, and you just don't trust God enough, well, guess what? You are now distracting yourself from your fears by doing the very things that increase your trust in Him. See, the problem is, 
we try to distract ourselves in the wrong ways. We turn on the television, we, we scroll our phone, we go out to a party, we put some kind of substance in our body that we think will, will dull the pain for a while. And of course, the substance wears off, the party ends, that series we're binging on Netflix is over, and the fears are still there. So instead, put your mind on the things above, the things that are good, the things that make for peace. At the beginning of this series, the second ser uh, sermon, in fact, I talked about uh, voices that increase our fear and limiting our exposure to those voices. And there were two I mentioned specifically, social media and the news. And I, I said it's time. It's not a sin to be on social media or to watch the news. In fact, I do both. But you have to limit your exposure to those things. You, you have to recognize that both of those are businesses. And they make a profit by keeping you engaged. And they keep you engaged by keeping you afraid. By keeping, you, by keeping things in front of you that, that make you think, oh, I, I better watch this. I better read about that. I, I need to know. Limit your exposure to that to the voices that cause you fear and think about beautiful things. Think about the things of God. Can you try that the next time you're afraid? Just, just get into the Word. Just praise His name. Just pray with all your heart and see what happens. You will, at bare minimum, you will end up spending that time much more productively than you otherwise would have. So think about good things, but then the second strategy, just as important, do the right thing. So in verse 9, the very next verse, it says, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. See, if it was just enough to think beautiful thoughts, then I would say, let's all go out into the desert, let's bring a loincloth and a hair shirt, and let's all find our little cave in the limestone and be monks. And just sit around pondering the beauty of life, shutting ourselves off from the stress and pondering how good God is. But no, we're supposed to live in the real world among people, among sinful people. And so Paul says, you've seen the way I function when I'm afraid. You've seen the way I manage stress, so do what I do. Now, if you step back and think about it, that sounds pretty arrogant, doesn't it? I, I wouldn't want to go to a church where a pastor said, all you have to do in order to obey God is just do what you've seen me do. I wouldn't say that as a Christian, as a pastor. Paul does. Guess what? Paul can say that. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. In the same way, we wouldn't think it wrong for a great baseball player to produce videos of that showing people how he swings the bat or how he throws a, a curveball or, or a, an entrepreneur who built his company from, from scratch to the Fortune 500 writes a book that says, this is how I did it and you can too, and we run out to buy it. Paul is saying, I have learned the ability to be content in any and every circumstance, so do the things you've seen me do. So what, what does Paul do? I think it's noteworthy that in verse 4, he mentions two specific things. He, he says, rejoice and be reasonable. So let's talk about those, and then we're done. Rejoice in the Lord always, he says. In fact, rejoice is the theme of the book of Philippians. It's the most joyful book in the whole Bible. Ironic, since Paul is writing from a Roman prison. And by the way, Roman prisons were less humane than our prisons. At least we feed and clothe our prisoners. The Romans didn't do that. If you didn't have family and friends to bring you food and bring you clothing, you went without. And yet Paul is able to write in such circumstances and say, I am overjoyed. I rejoice daily. Rejoice, he says. That's a command. Rejoice doesn't mean be optimistic. Look on the bright side. Expect the best. Optimism, which I appreciate. And I like people who are upbeat and positive. But optimism is not enough. Optimism alone will kill you because the best case scenario almost never happens. You'll live in a constant state of disappointment if all you have is optimism. No, what Paul has is greater. He has joy. And what that is, is the ability to find something in every circumstance with which to rejoice. Everything that happens. Again, like I said earlier, Paul is able to say, uh, you know, I don't know. They may kill me tomorrow, but if they do, I get to go to be with God. I get to be with Jesus. And if they set me free, I get to be with you guys. Either way, I win. 
Later, he talks about how, you know, I know there's these, these preachers who are jealous of me and who've, who've given me a hard time in the past, and now, now that I'm off the, off, out, of, out of the picture, they're out there making hay, and they're winning souls, and they're growing their followings, and, and they're doing it out of a sense of, of competition with me. Um, but I rejoice, because either way, the gospel's being preached. I mean, even if they have false motives, they're preaching the true gospel, so I can rejoice in that. Everything that happens, Paul's able to say, this may be sorrowful, this may be painful, I may weep, and yet I find reason to rejoice. Y'all, you need to understand, that is not an inner quality, that is something you choose. That is a choice you make to rejoice. Naturally, what we do in those circumstances is we feel sorry for ourselves either quietly or loudly, depending on our personality. But what I'm saying to you is the, the more afraid you are, the more you should say, today is my day to choose joy. And not just rejoice inwardly, but be a source of joy to the people who know you. So that's my test for you. Ask yourself the question, am I a source of joy to the people around me? When I walk into a room, does it lighten the mood? I'm not saying I'm the king of comedy, I'm, I'm the life of the party. Some of you are, but some of you are, or more, you're more quiet. But you should be the person who is able to point out the reasons to rejoice. Not the person who's constantly highlighting the reasons to be angry and afraid and upset. Which one are you? Are you the Debbie Downer, or are you the one who brings joy to every room you come into? Choose that. It may not be your nature. Choose it by, with the Lord's help. The second thing he says is, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. That word reasonable, we, we look at it in English and we think it means just be easygoing, but it actually means gentle. And, and gentleness and fear don't usually go together, and I'll prove it to you. If tomorrow you're drinking coffee at your kitchen table and a spider drops off the ceiling and lands on the table in front of you, your response will probably not be a gentle one. That's just my guess. You're probably not going to uh, dump out your coffee and, and gently trap the spider under the mug and say, this is one of God's creatures. And he's simply here to, uh, to eat bugs, which is something I appreciate. And so rather than harm it, it means me no harm. I'm going to take it outside and, and set it free so that it can go about its God-given purpose. You're not going to do that. You're going to go bonkers. In fact, if it happens, I want video because you are going to grab whatever is within arm's reach and beat the snot out of that thing. <laughs> and so when we're afraid, we don't react with gentleness. We don't act reasonably. What Paul is saying is, when you're afraid, choose to be gentle. And by gentle, I don't just mean nonviolent. Gentleness means refusing to insist on your own way. Y'all, this is the hard part for us as Americans because everything in our culture, and I'm talking left culture, I'm talking right culture, everything in our culture says stand up for your rights. Stand up for yourself. Don't let anybody mess with you. Don't let anybody inconvenience you. Don't let anybody offend you. We're so brittle, so quick to find offense. And the people yelling snowflake are the ones who are the most brittle. So what Paul is saying is, go the opposite way. When you're afraid, you be the one who looks out for the needs of others. You choose to be a source of peace, not somebody who puts gasoline on the fire, not somebody who answers hatred with hatred and mocking with mocking, but be the one who ends all the disputes because you can absorb all that offense. You can grow that thick skin. You can choose gentleness. Now, guess what you're doing when you're practicing these two things, when you're, when you're out there finding reasons to rejoice and, and choosing not to respond to offensive behavior or actions with anger and frustration, you know what you're doing? You're actively serving God and you've forgotten about your fears because you're active, because you're thinking of others. And you're showing that you trust Him. Because you're saying, okay, my natural tendency, Lord, is to just sit in my room in a fetal position and think about this scary thing, 
but I'm going to get up and go out into the world and rejoice and be gentle to others because I trust that while I'm doing those things, you're handling my problem. It's sort of like the advice I gave my kids. Just believe. It's going to be okay. I'm telling you, if you trust me, you're not going to be afraid. If we trust God, then we can spend our time instead of worrying and being afraid, studying his word, praying, praising, being gentle to others, rejoicing in the circumstances of life where we find reason for joy. Most Christians know the story behind the song, It Is Well With My Soul. I won't recount the whole thing, but simply to say, Chicago businessman Philip Spafford wrote the song after learning that his four daughters had all drowned in a shipwreck in the Atlantic Ocean. And that makes a lot of sense when you hear the first verse. When peace like a river descendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That makes perfect sense. Sorrow like sea billows did roll into his life and he trusted God. He learned to trust God. But for my money, the best verse in the song is verse 3. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. And it's beautiful, but you think, well, what does that have to do with grief and sorrow? And I think this is what it comes down to. When I told my kids not to worry about the hurricane, I hope they trusted me, I hope that helped, but it would have done them a lot more good if I could have walked outside and snapped my finger and made the storm stop. Jesus had that power. Jesus not only stilled a storm in the Sea of Galilee, Jesus is the one who stilled the greatest storm that we've ever faced. Because there was this, this storm that was coming from three different directions. It was coming from our own sin and rebellion against God and our alienation from him. And, and then also the power of, of the devil himself who was, who was drawing us away from God dragging us into hell with him. And then there was, there was the power of, of death itself. And all three forces had converged upon us, and we were lost. And Jesus stepped into that and said, I'll take that. And he carried that storm with him in that cross up the hill called Golgotha, and he died. And he killed that storm with him, nailed that storm to the cross, and then three days later walked out of the tomb. So if you want to know why you can trust God, why you can trust your father in the midst of the storm, there's a cross and there's an empty tomb, and that's all the evidence you need. You don't have to live consumed by fear. You'll always face times that tempt you to be afraid, but you can trust him, and the more you trust him, the less afraid you'll be. Think on good things. Do the right things. Learn to trust the God who defeated sin, death, and hell for you forever. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your patience with us. By now, we should have learned to trust you. And yet, it's so hard. Try so hard to eliminate these fearful, worrisome thoughts from our minds, but they keep on calling and nagging at us, and we just can't. So thank you for these instructions and help us to put them into practice. And when we're afraid, to use that as our cue to remind us to fill our minds with the things that are good and beautiful and true. And to be gentle and to be joyful, to be sources of light and peace to the people around us. Increase our trust in you, Lord. I pray that this would be a church that encourages those who are struggling, that bears one another's burdens. Lord, let us not be the same moving forward. And I pray especially for those who don't yet know you as Lord and Savior. If they're here this morning, I'm so grateful they are. And I pray that today would be their day of salvation. Lord, help us to have a burden for them like yours so that we would love them the way you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The name of Jesus is not a magical name. You can't just say Jesus and everything's good. But when it says we worship his name, it means we worship his character. We're going to sing a song about that, about how 
uh, when we praise the name of Jesus, we're praising who he is. And who he is is more than enough. If you don't know him, haven't experienced that personally, I hope you'll come forward. I'll be standing right here, welcome, ready to welcome you and tell you the next steps to take. If you want to join our church, if you just need prayer, this is a great time for that. But right now, let's take advantage of this time to praise his name. Let's stand.
the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Saw through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great Is the 
Father God, we thank you that you and you alone are our living hope, that we can put our hope, our faith, our trust all in you, that you have overcome every situation. And so, God, we know whatever may come against us, whatever may be blowing in our lives, you have overcome those things too and give us the ability in your strength to walk um, peacefully through those times. God, we thank you just for a time to be reminded of who you are and of what you've done what you desire to do in each of your children's lives. God, may we go from this place today encouraged, enthused, ready to be your servants at every turn of the road. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.